Good to be with you again. We're talking about the kingdom of God and specifically the times and seasons of our lives. We're walking through months and months of disrupted routines and broken schedules and new habits and new patterns. There are forces beyond our ability to see that seem to be continuing the disruption. It's an important time to know what our foundation is and who secures our future. I assure you it's not the government and it's not Dr. Fauci nor the WHO. God himself is the one who secures our future. We have much to celebrate. Grab your Bible and a notepad. Most of all, take a few minutes to open your heart for what God has for you today. And I want to start in Genesis 8 and verse 22. It says, as long as the earth endures, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night will never cease. I attended Old Roberts University. I began my, my college career there. And when I was there, Old Roberts was still very much active and engaged with the students and involved in the daily life of the university. And, and that was a life verse for him. His whole message, to those of you that are, would remember Old Roberts, he had a whole theme of his ministry around seed faith, and it was derived from that notion. I can't tell you how many times I heard him repeat that verse, that as long as the earth endures, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night will never cease. And I learned far more in college than I understood, and I learned far more from my exposure to Or Roberts than I understood in the season when I was there. When I was there, I was mostly ungrateful. It's unfortunate how we can miss seasons of our lives. Uh, I was there, I had a plan for my life. I was headed to graduate school and I knew what I wanted to do and that initial four years was just a speed bump in the way to where I was trying to get to. And anything that disrupted my momentum was an annoyance to me. We were required to attend chapel twice a week. And I remember thinking, what a bother. Um, the, the, we were required to take a course each semester. At the time, it seemed pretty innovative. It was recorded on video and we could retrieve it at our leisure. But it was a course that we did, I remember, for at least four semesters, and we may have done it for longer, on the Holy Spirit in the now. And it was Oral Roberts teaching us about the Holy Spirit. And I remember thinking, you know, I'm here for real academics. <laughs> Stupid is the word you're searching for. <laughs> I can help you with this. Because I had a life plan and ministry certainly wasn't at the top of the list. And, you know, I, I could sit in chapel and at least once a month, Oral would speak. And, uh, and I, I didn't appreciate it in the season. But years later, you know, I remember them saying to us that about 20% of the cost of our education was paid by tuition and President Roberts raised the rest for us. I didn't care. They would ask us occasionally to assemble, the students to assemble outside. They'd be doing some television programming and they'd want the students to be engaged at least as a backdrop or in some way. And I'd grumble and complain. And if I could find a reason, I'd try to be in the lab so I didn't have to participate. And they would invite partners of the ministry to campus and, They'd be walking through campus and looking at the prayer tower. They'd want to stop the students and talk to us. And we'd think, well, I'd think, what a nuisance. You know, I got someplace to go and something to do. Ungrateful is the word you're searching for. And years after I graduated, God met me while I was there for full exposure and changed the direction of my life and put a different vision in my heart in spite of me. But I took Kathy back some years later. I wanted her to see ORU. And when we stepped onto campus and we parked our car and we started up the hill where the, the prayer tower and the stuff was located, very unexpectedly, tears began to run down my face. And I was so convicted of my ingratitude and my bad attitude and how I had taken so many things for granted and how I had gobbled up blessings that other people had sacrificed for. And I'd been indifferent, so absorbed in my selfishness and my plans and what I wanted, what I intended. And I've looked back on that season so many times and there's so many lessons that I've taken away from that that are informing my life until today. That when I started this particular talk. I wanted to start with that verse because today's really grounded in life lessons, seasons, seasons when your attitude may not be great and the challenges before you 
may be uncomfortable and there may be times when there's new direction coming to your life. And it may be in the moment your responses aren't the right ones. In spite of all of those things, I can tell you from experience, if you'll cooperate, the Lord will lead you forward. The Lord will lead you forward. We're walking through a season unlike any I have ever walked through before. And to be candid with you, it has required reflection on every aspect of my life in order to continue to navigate the challenges that come because I don't have experience with what we're walking through. I've never seen the things we've experienced together in the last 20 months or so, and I don't think we're finished yet. The word season is the best I know. The video editors came to me a few weeks ago and said, can't you use another word? Do you have a thesaurus? <laughs> Why, no. <laughs> I don't blame them. But I really don't have a better term for what's happening to us than something that I understand to be somewhat transitory. I don't believe it's permanent. And yet, in the time that we're encompassed by it, by the time that it's defining our experience, it's pretty much all-encompassing. It defines everything about our lives for this period of time. Ecclesiastes, there's a similar passage. It says there's a time for everything and a season for every activity under heaven. A time to be born and a time to die. A time to plant and a time to uproot. A time to kill and a time to heal. A time to tear down and a time to build. A time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance, a time to scatter stones and a time to gather them, a time to embrace and a time to refrain, a time to search and a time to give up, a time to keep and a time to throw away, a time to tear and a time to mend, a time to be silent, a time to speak, a time to love, a time to hate, a time for war and a time for peace. There are different seasons to our lives. And they are often unwelcome. But I think there's something that we're going to have to learn in our current place if we're going to flourish in what's ahead of us. So just some simple observations around seasons in your lives or beyond your life. The first and the most obvious, I think it's foolish to fight the season. You know, this is fall. And if you're planting your garden, you're going to be disappointed. Because the lettuce isn't going to come up in six weeks and the tomatoes won't be ripe in 90 days. It's not the right season. It's a different time. It doesn't mean that spring won't come again and there won't be another opportunity to plant a garden, but it's foolish to fight the seasons. So it's very important to understand the season you're in. It's true spiritually. It's true for your life. It's true for your family. Recognize the season you're in and don't spend your energy fighting it and being angry about it. You may not like the cooler temperature. It'll get hot again. It's Tennessee. The humidity will return. Trust me. The second observation I would make is that seasons are temporary. They're temporary both in opportunity and in the challenges they present. In the fall, we think of the harvest and I learned this about harvest time, it doesn't last forever. In fact, if you don't get the crops in, whatever they may be, you will lose them. So harvest time is all hands on deck. It's a time of great intensity, terrific effort, because you're gonna need the harvest for the winter that is ahead. So there's a tremendous opportunity in some seasons, and then some seasons bring tremendous challenges. Great effort, great toil, endurance is required, but that too is a season. The effort that's invested in harvest is not a permanent effort because the harvest will be complete and there'll be a time to rest. And I don't know what the season that you're walking through is right now. It's far beyond COVID because life hasn't been suspended. We're still getting diagnosis that we wish we hadn't received. We're still facing challenges within our relationships. Our businesses still have to work in spite of all the things that we hear. We're still neighbors and families and citizens together in a community and, and life is still happening. The children are still having school with all the challenges that come with that. And if you're in a triumphant time, enjoy it. If you're in a season of mourning and grief, understand that the challenge will pass too. That's important to know. There's a third observation. You know, seasons typically require a unique response. 
How you behave in the summer probably isn't the same behavior you'll want in the winter. Your wardrobe will change, your diet will change, your vitamin D level will change. Seasons require unique responses. Don't be panicked by that, understand it. For those of us who don't like change, it's a bit off-putting. Couldn't we just wear the same thing? Somebody stopped me this morning and they said on, th- said on Thanksgiving Day, they set their scale back 10 pounds. <laughs> now there's an idea I could get behind. <laughs> Seasons also are a time for preparation for what's next because the season will change. It's very important that you guard your heart and your emotions and your thoughts Folks, the world we're walking through right now, whether you're talking about the broader picture and the things we're watching on on a national scale or an international scale, or whether it's far more personal and the circumstances of your life are challenging or triumphant. If it's a time of great harvest and great plenty, I I assure you there are lean times ahead. And if you're walking through a lean season, you should understand that that season will yield to a time of greater abundance. I believe what we're watching happening unfold us across our nation and around the earth is a change of season. I don't know what the outcome will be yet, but I know this is a time of preparation. So with that background, I want to give you a little bit more personal information because as as I was praying through last week and the, the time that was available over Thanksgiving, there were some lessons I was reminded of. My father was a veterinarian. When I lived at home, he practiced veterinary medicine. And for the most of the time I was there, he had an equine practice. He only treated horses. Just before I left, he, he, he started treating small animals, dogs and cats. But most of my time around there was around horses and the things that went with that. Most of the horses didn't come to us. We had to go to them, so there was a lot of travel. And one of the treats for my brothers and I was to get to make a call with my dad. So we would pile in the vehicle that he was driving. He had to take his medicines with him and everything he needed to treat the horse to wherever the farmers had their horses. So we would climb in the station wagon or the truck or whatever the vehicle was, and you had a lot of windshield time. And then you got to be engaged in the, whatever the activity was around a horse. There were quite a few life lessons from that. And I didn't realize the benefits from some of the windshield time either. But I'm still benefiting from the things I learned from those days. I read a verse this week, and I thought about it for several days before I started running the references on it. It was Nehemiah 3.8. It says, above the horse gate, the priest made repairs, each in front of his own house. Some of you remember that Nehemiah was a cupbearer to the Persian king, and when he heard from a traveler that Jerusalem was in disrepair, he was grieved by it and ended up making the commitment to go back to Jerusalem to rebuild the walls around the city. And Nehemiah made a journey at night around the broken down walls of Jerusalem. It had been destroyed by the Babylonians. And the archaeologists in the university in Israel today use Nehemiah's description around his, that night journey he made around Jerusalem and knowing where to dig to find the ancient walls of Jerusalem. But the old city of Jerusalem is a walled city. It was for defensive purposes and there's gates into the city. And most of those gates are named by function either by the direction they lead or by the primary use of that gate. If you visit Jerusalem today, the gates have some different names. There's Jaffa Gate and the road leads to Jaffa. You're so smart. (laughs) And there's the Damascus Gate and the road would lead to Damascus. And you know some characters in the Bible that travel that Damascus Road. And there's the Sheep Gate or the Lion's Gate and there's the Dung Gate. Well, the names have been different. And when I read that Nehemiah, and it, it's a, it was a gate that was used throughout hundreds of years of the city of Jerusalem, the horse gate. And I smiled when I read it because I've been visiting Jerusalem since I was a boy and I've seen donkeys in the streets and camels in the periphery of the city, but I've never seen the city of Jerusalem filled with horses. But I assure you at one time, they were as common there as the cars are today. And one of the gates was built to accommodate that, the horse gate. I smiled and I thought, the season changed. Now I'm not talking about a 90 day window in time because horses were a prominent part of the life of Jerusalem for hundreds and hundreds of years. And today they would be there just as a novelty. Change came. 
And there are times when cataclysmic changes come and redirect the course of our lives and how we encounter one another and how we travel and, and how we conduct ourselves. And I began to think about the lessons that I took away from those seasons in my life when I spent a lot of time with horses and barns. I mentioned Jaffa Gate a few moments ago. Some of you may know a bit of history. World War I, Brigadier General Edmund Allenby was the commander of the British forces in North Africa and then into the Middle East. And he defeated the Turks. The Turks had had authority over the Middle East for 400 years. They inherited the old Ottoman Empire. And General Allenby defeated the Turks and retook Jerusalem. The whole Middle East was realigned at the end of World War I. And when he came to Jerusalem, he dismounted from his horse. There are pictures of it. He said he didn't deserve to ride a horse into the city where his Lord had suffered, that he would walk through the Jaffa Gate. That's a lot of humility in a conquering general. Wouldn't it be good to see those that let lead us today with that kind of a tangible faith expressed in God? Amen. Amen. Well, I spent a season of my life around horses. And if you'll allow me, I want to take just a couple of minutes and give you some lessons that I took away from that season. It wasn't a long time in my life. You know, when I look back at the time, it seemed interminable. Like I was born in a barn and I was never going to get out of the barn. And life for me, happiness for me was Murfreesboro in the rearview mirror and no more barns. And I pretty much left with that attitude. And somewhere along the way, I found that the, the most comforting place in the world for me, no matter where I've been, and I've had the privilege of traveling a good bit, is coming back to Middle Tennessee. I seldom walk back in the house after Kathy and I have been gone for more than 24 hours without saying to her, it's the most beautiful place in the world, home. Doesn't matter where you go. And all those things I was trying to escape with the, the horses and the barns and the odor that would seem to, seem to cling to. You know, if you clean stalls for three or four hours, when I was in high school, occasionally that would happen to me. And you had a date on the evening after. It doesn't matter how hot the water is in the shower or how potent the soap, everything smells like the barn. That's not a blessing. No, you smell lovely, like a horse. But there were some lessons from that season that are helpful for me today. And the first one I would share to you was it wasn't something that I chose. You know, that season of my life had nothing to do with anything that I volunteered for. It was chosen for me. My parents made those decisions. I didn't. I didn't volunteer to be a helper in the vet practice. I just wanted to eat. I didn't really volunteer to clean stalls or to help treat sick animals but I wanted the clothes I needed to go to school and that was part and parcel of something that was chosen around me. And it wasn't a bad season and not everything about your life reflects your choice. But it doesn't mean it's, it is negative. It doesn't mean it's destructive. It doesn't have to be harmful. You may be agitated by it or annoyed by it or even angered by it. You may resent it and you may push against it much like I did when I was in college. But if you will allow the Spirit of God, there's an opportunity in the midst of that season. And if you're thinking the circumstances of your birth or the events that have happened to you or the way life has unfolded around you is unfair and this isn't what you dreamt of or this wasn't what you were chosen or you were created for something better than that, all of those things, while they may be true statements, are not a helpful attitude to hold in moving forward. I didn't choose that. And yet it was a very, very fruitful time in my life. It was a time when there was some responsibility that I had to learn to carry. I wasn't overly excited about that. My parents used to call it maturing. I didn't want to mature. I want to be on the record. I never volunteered to mature. I was quite happy for somebody else to be the responsible party and me to be irresponsible. I was good with that. I don't ever remember getting up and looking in the mirror in the morning going, today's the day I would like to mature. Never. 
Somebody had to care enough about me to entrust me with little slivers of responsibility and then to invest the energy and the effort to bring the discipline to see to it that I would address it appropriately. I pray somebody cares enough about you to do that as well. If you're not aware of it, God does. In Hebrews 12, it says he disciplines those he loves. And if he doesn't discipline you, you're an illegitimate child. You're not really his. Don't chafe at the Lord's discipline. Thank him for it. That's not easily done. And oftentimes it'll take hindsight in order to find that attitude. But I can tell you the responsibility I took away from those years has proven to be very valuable to me because the horses had to be watered and fed whether I was in the mood or not. They didn't take holidays. They didn't care about the temperature. It didn't matter to them if it was raining. They still wanted to be fed and their water buckets were empty. It annoyed me. Couldn't we, couldn't we find a way to fill those buckets automatically? I suppose we could, but that's why God puts you here. Go water the horses. <laughs> They're overweight anyway. Couldn't they eat every other day? Sure, they can, and so can you. <laughs> I'll go feed the horses. The stalls didn't stay clean. What an annoyance. You could do the most beautiful job of accomplishing your task. I mean, it was photo worthy. Anybody would have appreciated the immaculate nature of that stall. And within a matter of minutes, that stupid beast would make a mess. <laughs> it was a season where there were a lot of opportunities for learning. I didn't understand I was learning. I was being interrogated usually. How much water did that horse drink? Well, I don't know. How many times did you fill the water bucket? Well, I can tell you that. Did he eat all the grain? How much hay did they eat? I don't know. Well, let's go look. Was there anything left in the food trough? How much did he push out onto the floor? I thought they were just checking on my work product. I didn't understand they were trying to determine the, the health and the well being of the animal. I learned a lot about nutrition and the awareness of health. In fact, the kind of mess that was in the stall told a great deal to do about the health of the animal that was occupied there. I learned far more about wellness and health from taking care of those animals than, than any class I ever sat in. I learned a lot about respect. Not for the people around me, I had to learn to respect those animals because you really couldn't afford to be careless. If you were too distracted or too caught up in your own thoughts and you weren't paying attention to what was going on around you, there could be significant consequences because they really weren't care. They didn't care that much about my emotions and they'd be gone. And a horse that somebody valued a great deal would be running down the highway. And that is not a blessing. <laughs> I learned a bit about the importance of genetics because in the animal world, genetics makes a huge difference. Folks, in the human world, it makes a tremendous difference, too. I don't mean your family of origin issues. I'm not talking about your texture of your hair. But in order to participate in the kingdom of God, you have to be born into it. We don't earn our way into it. It's not about degrees on the wall or resources accumulated or your athletic prowess or your intellectual capacity, participation in the kingdom of God isn't about joining the right church or finding the right denomination or reading the right translation of the Bible. You have to be born into that kingdom. And it comes through faith in a person and his name is Jesus of Nazareth. Springtime was my favorite season of the year when I was with the animals because that was the time of the year when the mares would fall. And they would inevitably bring some of the brood mares to the, to the veterinarian, so he would watch over that birthing process. The, they'd had a lot of money invested and they wanted a live foal for many reasons. So we would, this was before we had video cameras and we'd do vigils all night long. And I, I discovered really early that a mare was pretty clever at having that foal born when there wasn't anybody watching. You take a 10 minute break and she would deliver and you would lose the joy of the Lord. But I love that time of year. I love to see the new foals running in the pastures and the energy and the strength. And they, they would have they, an enthusiasm that was beyond their physical abilities. So they'd get up to speed running, but their brakes didn't work. And they'd run into one another or the fence or something. And it was great fun to laugh at. But I loved the, the burst of life and the promise that came with that. 
and watching them grow and develop. I watched the instinct with them when they were born and they really couldn't manage their legs and they tried to stand up and they'd inevitably collapse, but they had a powerful instinct to nurse. They needed that food to survive and they knew it intuitively. God puts some things within us. He gave you a conscience. We know right and wrong. We know good from evil. We have to choose to ignore God. We've had to choose not to be interested in him. He put that instinct within us to seek him, to develop a relationship with him. We are hardwired with that, just as certainly as a newborn foal is hardwired to get up on top of those long legs that they have and find that mother's whip milk. You and I are hardwired to know God. We have had to turn the volume down on that, to diminish it, to be disinterested, to find something else that we thought would sustain us. There's some biblical horse stories I'd like to take a few minutes with. This could be a season, but it's for another, I mean, a series, but it's for another time. But I'll start in Zechariah. I've been reading the prophets a great deal lately. Zechariah chapter 10 says, ask the Lord for rain in the springtime. It's the Lord who makes the storm clouds. He gives showers of rain to men and plants of the field to everyone. Israel does not have a consistent water source. And it was an agricultural society. They needed the crops to survive and to prosper. And so they were very dependent upon the cycle of rain. It's a desert country and the rain only comes in a very limited time. And if you miss the rain that you expect in the rainy season, poverty and hunger are coming. So when the Bible talks about rain, it's about prosperity and abundance and food and survivability. He gives showers of rain to men and plants of the field to everyone. The idols speak deceit and diviners seek visions that lie and they tell dreams that are false and they give comfort in vain. Most of the idols were about prosperity. They were Canaanite fertility gods. And if you would worship these idols, you would have more, more food, more pleasure, more something. But what they promised was false. Therefore, the people wander like sheep, oppressed for lack of a shepherd. My anger burns against the shepherds, and I will punish the leaders. For the Lord Almighty will care for his flock in the house of Judah and make them like a proud horse in battle. It got my attention. Horses have personalities. I used to have this line. I used to say that I wanted one of my horses to talk to me. I knew that Balaam's donkey had talked to him, and I thought that horses were smarter than donkeys. And if a donkey could talk to Balaam, surely a horse could talk to Alan. And for years I'd walk around going, one day one of these horses is gonna talk to me. You know, when you walk in the barn early in the morning and then you're the one that normally feeds, when you walk in, they'll start to make some noise because they know breakfast is coming. And if you're late, they'll make more noise. I promise. Well, we had a friend visiting, a a woman far more godly than myself. And she heard me make that statement that the horses would talk to me one day. And she said, Alan, have you ever thought about the condition Balaam was in when his donkey spoke up? And I said, no, not really. And she said, well, the angel of the Lord was there about to kill him. And he was so clueless, so faithless, so self-absorbed, he was totally unaware of how far he'd strayed from God's invitations for his life. Do you really want a horse to talk to you? I said, no, I'm good, thank you. I want to be able to hear that still small voice, that gentle whisper from God. But when Zechariah talks about a horse proud in battle, I assure you that horses understand the circumstances around them. We lived in on the thoroughbred tracks for a bit and a a thoroughbred on the track has an alertness and an awareness that's different from a plow horse. I mean, there is an electricity in them, an energy in them that requires constant vigilance from whoever's handling them. You take one of our Tennessee walking horses to the, to the horse show with the lights and the activity and the trailer ride and the barn, you better believe they understand when they step into the ring. There's a transformation in them. There's a transformation in them when you just put them on the trailer. They know something's coming. You have to teach them to load on a trailer. That's not normal for a horse to want to go for a ride. You've heard me tell the stories about Murphy, the little burrow we had. A little burrow for a while. We used him for Christmas parades and Palm Sunday and whatever back in the day. And because I had used to train yearlings a little bit, I got the assignment to train Murphy. And one of my first assignments was to train him for the Christmas parade. 
We were going to have Mary and Joseph and the wise men and some banners, and we would participate in the Christmas parade. And I had church, so I get to the, where they're staging the parade, parade ground that day, and the, Mary is there, and Joseph is there, and the shepherds and the wise men are there, but there's no Murphy. And the truck and the trailer are there, and I looked, and Murphy wasn't in the trailer. So I went over to see the person who was assigned to bring Murphy, and they said, well, he didn't want to get in the trailer. <laughs> and I didn't say it, because I was in my pastor hat. <laughs> but I promise you, it was running through. I said, oh, really? Did he tell you? Did Murphy talk to you? Because I knew that beast and he hadn't said anything to me and I'd given him reason to. <laughs> he didn't want to come to the parade. They looked at me and said, the burrow did not want to come to the parade. <laughs> and I said, oh, I really think he does. <laughs> Give me the keys to the truck. So I drove out to where Murphy was lounging and he had had a change of heart. <laughs> he was excited about the Christmas season. He was joyful at being invited to the parade. He decided to take a ride in the trailer. By the time we got back to the staging area on Greenland Drive, the parade was long gone. And here's Pastor and Murphy but not to be left behind. We're going to catch the parade because Murphy really wanted to be in the Christmas parade by this point. So we're chasing the parade down the street. Now there's police officers stationed along the route of the parade to be sure it's safe. And I come to the first one and he stops me. He said, the parade's already left. I said, no, sir, this is Mary's ride. <laughs> and he didn't know me and I didn't know him. And he kind of smiled at me and he said, okay. And I watched him get on his radio as we're jogging past. And all, by the time I'm about the third officer, they're just waving me down the road like it's a runway. <laughs> Horses understand what's happening around them. I promise you. There's an energy. Uh, there's an excitement. There's a preparedness. They have a situational awareness. A good horse, a champion, has a heart that recognizes those moments. A horse that's not a champion, they'll quit in a minute. I mean, Murphy had a little bit of encouragement. I don't know if he was a champion, but he was a homer. <laughs> Has nothing to do with the sermon, but I'll tell you, what, I'll tell you the, the, Murphy's last act here before he got to go to the pasture. We brought him for Palm Sunday. We used to have a little porch on the front of the church. It wasn't a big crowd, but we'd, on Palm Sunday, we'd bring Murphy over for the children to see. We built a little pen, and Murphy was out in front, and everything was in place, and he had his hay, and everything, everybody was content. And we had the signs up, don't pet Murphy. And it's time for church to start. I mean, it's time for church to start. And somebody walks in and said, Murphy escaped. Now, the highway did, 99 didn't look like it does today. There was a handful of cars occasionally, and Murphy was running down the highway because he knew where home was. <laughs> and apparently, he didn't want to come to church that day. <laughs> he was home watching on live stream, like many of you are. <laughs> so, <laughs> but there was, a, there was a traffic wrist with Murphy on the loose. So here we are in our suits and ties chasing a burrow up and down Highway 99. And after that, we decided his public life could be set aside for the pleasures of being in the field. It has nothing to do with our sermon. <laughs> but that situational awareness that even an animal possesses would be beneficial to us. We're in a unique season. It's not the same, folks. We may not like it. We didn't choose it. We didn't volunteer for it. But it's necessary for us to be alert and prepared and anticipatory. We're walking through a season of shaking and realignment. The whole world is being realigned. You may be uncomfortable. You may prefer not to notice. You might try to look away, but it's an important time. We need some personal evaluation. What's the nature of your relationship with the Lord? I understand that there's powerful forces pulling to divide us. People that I have the highest respect for. 
People that I have done a lot of life with, we're, we're struggling in this season to maintain our alignment. There are powerful forces pulling at us and they're not godly forces. Well, there are ideas attached to it and circumstances attached to it, but there's a demonic force that's bringing division and hatred and resentment amongst us. We need an awareness of the season. We need to understand how valuable we are. What binds us together is an allegiance to Jesus of Nazareth. And we will find ways to stand together, even in places where we may not be in complete agreement in the moment. You see, situational awareness demands of us to prepare for what's next. Because we're not going back. Different has come to stay. I don't know everything that's ahead of us, but I assure you it's not going to look just like 2019. And in those situations, your character is revealed, just like those horses that demonstrate heart or those that quit. Again, I know the circumstances of your life aren't dependent just upon the broader picture in the world. We still have life happening around us in our families and our circumstances and the details. And we've got to trust the Lord with that. We have to stand together with that. It's why the division is so disruptive. We need one another. We need one another's prayers. We need one another's strength. We need the courage we gain together. We need the compassion that we can show together. In Jeremiah, there's another horse story. Remember Jeremiah? We just read it. It's a difficult book. Jeremiah is a prophet and his message is one of destruction. He's saying to the Hebrew people, God's judgment is coming for you and there's absolutely nothing you can do. Take a picture of your home because it's going to be destroyed. That's the living Bible. Jeremiah didn't say that. Well, Jeremiah complains to God. Have you ever complained to God? I do. He can withstand your complaints about his poor job performance. In Jeremiah chapter 12 and verse 1, he says, You are always righteous, O Lord, when I bring a case before you. Yet I would speak with you about your justice. Why does the way of the wicked prosper? And why do all the faithless live at ease? You have planted them and they have taken root and they grow and bear fruit and you're always on their lips, but far from their hearts. Yet you know me, O Lord, and you see me and test my thoughts about you. Drag them off like sheep to be butchered. Set them apart for the day of slaughter. Do you expect those last two sentences from the prophet? God's man. And what's Jeremiah's prayer? Drag my opponents off like sheep to be butchered. Jeremiah is not in a good space. Is it safe to say that? He's complaining to God. He's impugning God's character. He said, I know you're always righteous, but I have a case to bring before you. You have caused the wicked to prosper and the ungodly to do well, and, and you're doing nothing to discipline the immoral. Set them apart for the day of slaughter. And then God responds to Jeremiah. Same chapter, it's verse five. I just left one verse out. This is Jer God's message to Jeremiah. If you have raced with men on foot and they have worn you out, how can you compete with the horses? If you stumble in safe country, how will you manage in the thickets by the Jordan? Jeremiah, if you can't even keep up on level ground, what are you going to do when there's briars? What are you going to do when you have to navigate a thicket? Jeremiah, if the foot soldiers have outrun you, what are you going to do with the horses? See, when I read that, there's several images. I have the tremendous strength of a horse has always been amazing to me. On many occasions, I've had the, with, the, with the strength in their neck, they'll pick you up like your paper mache. You have to put a horse to sleep. You have to lay it on the ground so it's safe to do some medical procedure. Typically, you'd, somebody, usually me, would get to sit on their neck just to kind of keep them in place. It wasn't that your weight would hold them, but your pressure there would, would keep them from struggling to get back up, hopefully. Well, as a younger person, that terrified me. You know, you sit here on this horse's neck, I'm going to go get the medicine. Oh, sure, you're afraid. You're going to leave me here. But on a number of occasions, I remember as a horse would begin to wake up and you'd want them to get up in a safe way, they'd be regain their awareness and their strength. I mean, they just lift their head. They'd toss me. I was a bit lighter than today, but they'd still toss me like I was made out of styrofoam. Or have hold of a horse's halter and have them pick you up off the ground like you were a rag doll. 
tremendous strength and, and power within them. And, and God says to Jeremiah, Jeremiah, if you've been wearied by the foot soldiers, how are you going to run with the horses? And I read that and I say, God, I want to run with the horses. I want to run with the horses. Folks, we're going to have to look at our attitudes. It's really fashionable today, even within the body of Christ, to be frustrated or annoyed or angered, critical of someone, thinking God's not doing it right. Somebody has the wrong platform or the wrong microphone or somebody's response, and, and we're annoyed and we're distracted and we're looking at the wrong things. We're quite certain we're correct because that's the default position of religious people. <laughs> we're always right. And that leaves very little margin within us for God to lead us and invite change into us. If we're going to run with the horses, we're going to have to be willing to let God develop an attitude within us. A new attitude within us. I didn't put it in your notes, but in Philippians chapter 2, in verse 5, it says, your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus. Did you know God cares about our attitude? If you had to find a word to describe the Exodus generation after they left the Red Sea, before they got to the Promised Land, and you only could use two or three words, I bet one of those words would be grumbling and complaining, right? It was the hallmark of their journey. God fed them every day. He provided them water every day. He took care of all their health care. They had a complete health care plan. And they still complained. They grumbled about the menu. They grumbled about the road that God chose. They grumbled that there were enemies. God delivered them from their enemies, but they still grumbled. He gave them assignments. He gave them priests. He gave them a way to worship. And they complained their way through. In reality, they were in training. Is it possible that we could be in training? Is it possible that there's a harvest in front of the church unlike any we've ever seen before? I don't mean this congregation. Church with a capital C. Is there an opportunity in the world for the proclamation of the gospel unlike any we've ever seen, but we weren't prepared to engage the harvest, so God has engaged us in a time of training, of reorienting our vision, of changing our priorities, of seeing our world differently. Say, but I didn't want to do that. I was good where I was. I understand, but it's also possible we could forfeit that for which we were created. I don't want to be like the, 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 the Hebrew slaves that got to the boundaries of the Jordan River and they said, it is a land that flows with milk and honey. You've told us the truth, but it looks like too much effort to me. We're good where we are. It says God was angry with them and said, you can die where you are. I don't want to say that to the Lord. I want to hear him when he says to me, if you're weary from running with the foot soldiers, what are you going to do when I unleash the horses? I can tell you this, you can't run with the horses in your strength. You can't train enough to run with the horses. It's not a matter of age or youth. They're stronger and they're faster. We'll need a power beyond ourselves to run with the horses. Everybody stumbles in the thickets. We'll need a power beyond ourselves to help us navigate those thickets. In the past, maybe you could navigate your life. Maybe the circumstances were such that you could maintain it. You could keep it together. You could give a good presentation and everybody would look and go, oh, it's going really well. But maybe your circumstances have changed and the reports about you are different and you can't navigate any longer. You can't keep it together. We need the power of God. The circumstances around us are not going to provide the security and the safety and the continuity that we've been familiar with. We may question God's justice, but I believe God is inspecting our character. And in Psalms, we're going to learn some lessons about trust. Psalm 33 and verse 17, a horse is a vain hope for deliverance despite all its great strength. Or Psalm 147, his pleasure is not in the strength of the horse, nor his delight in the legs of a man. The Lord delights in those who fear him, who put their hope in his unfailing love. Psalm 20, some trust in chariots and some in horses, but we trust in the name of the Lord our God. We've placed our trust in some wrong things. Governments, documents, schools, educational systems, institutions. I'm not opposed to any of them, but they cannot secure our future and the future of our children. 
in our personal strength, in our intellect, in our academic accomplishments, in the resources we can accumulate it. Again, none of those things are wrong. I'm grateful for all of them, but they can't secure our future. God is orchestrating within us a trust transfer, an incremental development of trust in God. He's constantly saying to his people, you've trusted in the wrong things. You've trusted in an alliance with Egypt. You've trusted in chariots that you could purchase and the horses of Egypt, but the strength of the horse won't deliver you. And the strength of those things in which we've trusted is proving to be weak and inconsistent. It's crumbling around us. But God hasn't abandoned us. He hasn't withdrawn from us. Our future is not bleak. It's hopeful. There's an opportunity before us, but God is asking to place our trust in him in new ways. That last section is longer than our clock. Horses and chariots in the days of battle. Proverbs 21 says the horse is made ready for the day of battle, but victory rests with the Lord. It's not our strength or our armaments, or our constitution or our political parties, nor our numbers that will bring us victory. Victory rests with the Lord. If you don't take anything else away today, that little phrase is probably worthwhile living with for several days. Father, I know victory rests with you. I know victory rests with you. Not in the strength of my enemies or my physical health or the balance in my accounts or the employees that I can or I can't find. Victory rests with you. God, you are my victory. See, we've had so much, so much abundance, so much freedom, so much liberty. We haven't really had to be dependent upon God. We could treat God like an accommodation, like an addition, kind of a pleasant app, but he wasn't essential to our lives. Well, in this season, in the season in front of us, I assure you, God is going to be essential. Amen. Revelation chapter six is a powerful chapter. We meet these four horses of the apocalypse. Some of you, I'm sure, will remember them. There's a white horse. We better read that part. I watched as the lamb opened the first of the seven seals and I heard one of the four living creatures say, in a voice like thunder, come, and I looked and there before me was a white horse. And its rider held a bow and he was given a crown and he rode out as a conqueror bent on conquest. The white horse of the gospel riding into the earth. It's the first of the four horses that are to be released. And then there's a fiery red horse Death and a black horse, lack and pale horse. Death and Hades are coming. Shortages and lack and death unleashed upon the earth. When I read that in the context of scripture, a horse was the fastest means of land transportation available to a human being. It was the quickest way from here to there. We've lost that imagination, but for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years, that was the, the truth for humanity. So when John writes this story, he's describing something that's going to happen swiftly, quickly. I believe it's a season. It's something that's temporary. There are going to be swift, dramatic changes. Without stopping to unpack the nature of those four horses and the, and the message they're going to bring to this earth, but it's something that will encompass the whole earth in a time when that was an impossibility. We were isolated by our ability to travel and communicate. And John saw something else, something that traveled the whole earth in a very short amount of time. But the lead item in that is there was a season for the proclamation of the gospel. In the midst of the loss and the anger and the division and, and all the things we see. In Revelation 19, we have an important presentation of Jesus. Verse 11, I saw heaven standing open and there before me was a white horse whose rider is called faithful and true. With justice he judges and makes war, and his eyes are like blazing fire, and on his head are many crowns. He has a name written on him that no one knows but he himself. And he's dressed in a robe, dripped in blood, and his name is the word of God. Who is that? It's our Lord on a white horse. Stepping back into time, the armies of heaven were following him, riding on white horses and dressed in fine linen, white and clean. And out of his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations. And he'll rule them with an iron scepter. There's a new kingdom coming. There's a new king coming. He's not coming in a stable. 
He's not being born in the vulnerable package of an infant. There's going to be somebody other than shepherds attending him. He won't be cared over by two teenagers for whom there was no room at the inn and they had no access to power or other accommodations. He's coming with the armies of heaven. And he'll tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God Almighty. On his robe and on his thigh he has written the name King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Now, I don't want you to miss the rest of that chapter. Just one verse. Same chapter, Revelation 19, verse 19. It says, I saw the beast. And the kings of the earth, the Antichrist, and all the kings of the earth, and their armies gathered together to make war against the rider on the horse and his army. Revelation 19 is the chapter of triumph of our Lord. His victorious re-entry into time as a conquering king and the judge of all the earth. But it's also a subtle reminder of the persistence of evil. And we cannot yield. As comfortable as it might be, Maybe you're tired and you're weary and you're, you're tired of looking at the ungodliness and the immorality and all the stuff that's a part of it. But I believe this, the, the assignment from the New Testament still stands and having done everything to stand, we have to stand. In order to, to complete our course, we have to be overcomers. It's the message of the book of Revelation. Faith and perseverance go together. And the only way I know to learn perseverance is to persevere. And the reality is our strength is small. And we do grow weary. And sometimes our adversaries seem to outnumber us and they certainly seem to be able to overpower us. Maybe the challenges before you today seem to have a power and present a threat that in yourself you're incapable of walking back. But the one we serve is not threatened. He's not intimidated. Folks, we are more than people who have joined a religious movement or gathered inside of a building, or joined a religious tradition, or affiliated ourselves with a denomination, or prefer a translation, or a style of worship. We are children of the King. And there's much I don't understand about the season that we are in, and the change that has initiated it. There's some things I do understand, but there's much that I don't. But I trust the Lord to bring us through. And if there's a turning loose for some things that defined a previous season, release them with joy. If you're walking through a difficult personal time, there are challenges and obstructions and threats and all sorts of things that seem to be barriers to what you would imagine. Trust God to deliver them in your life. There's a strength available to us beyond ourselves. If he's going to ask us to run with the horses, he'll give us the strength we need to do so. What a wonderful promise. There are prophets who outran the chariots of wicked kings. There are shepherd boys who took down giants who were trained in military tactics and strategy. Our God is able to deliver, not based upon our strength or our intellect or our resources, but upon our willingness to trust him. And he's asking us to learn to trust him in some new ways. And it's easy to grumble and complain and say, we liked it better in Egypt, but if we will put our trust in him, he will bring us through. You're not alone. We don't have to be divided. We don't have to be angry and resentful and embittered. We stand together beneath the banner of the Lordship of Jesus Christ. We've, made been, we've been made clean by his blood. We've been justified and sanctified and set apart for the purposes of God. And those circumstances define us more than anything else about us. It's an important time for the church and the earth. Don't be discouraged. Don't be discouraged. Don't welcome discouragement. Discouragement comes to all of us. It comes to every one of us, myself included. But don't welcome it. Don't set a place for it at the table. Don't celebrate it. Well, I've been expecting you. Well, I've been expecting you to leave. <laughs> there are some disappointments in our lives. They come to all of us. But don't entertain them. Lord, I'll trust you. I'll trust you. I brought you a prayer. There's hope. That prayer at the bottom means I will hush. <laughs> Why don't you stand with me? It's a prayer you can take with you through the week. Please don't leave your prayers at church. We need God's people to be praying. 
every day, multiple times during the day. If you work in a place where there are other believers, pull them aside for a moment and have a prayer. Take five minutes of a break and, and share a prayer together. Read a psalm together. Begin to invite God into your lives in new ways. Let's begin to introduce God into places where we never introduced him before. Folks, it's time. It is time. Not for somebody else to be different, not for someone else to change, but for us to begin to talk to the Lord in new ways. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, you determine the times and the seasons. We are your creation. Grant us discerning hearts to recognize the opportunities and responsibilities of this time. Forgive us for grumbling and complaining. Renew our strength and refresh our soul. You are our deliverer, our redeemer, and our king. We rejoice in your great provision for our lives. Holy Spirit, awaken us to walk in the fullness of God's purpose for our lives. May our hearts be steadfast. Empower us as never before to proclaim the good news to our generation. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Hey, this is Pastor Allen. Thank you for watching this video. If you enjoyed it, like it, and most importantly, share it with your friends. If you want to be notified when there's new content and we post new material, if you'll just subscribe to my channel and hit the bell, you'll get the notification. Most of all, I pray God blesses you as you continue on your spiritual journey and open your heart to the Lord. God bless.